Hey, Paul, welcome back to a new episode of Pope Francis Generation. And today's topic is pastoral care for gay men and women. Why this topic as we wrap up our first season? Yeah, the short answer for why this topic is one of one of the Pope Francis Generation subscribers um, requested. Uh, he liked the way that we've um, re-examined different things. Um, and he, so he suggested um, the topic of homosexuality which I had considered talking about, I mean, really for the past several weeks since we started this season, but whether or not we should talk about this. Um, but I've been hesitant. I mean, mainly for the reason of, um, I don't want to speak about people without people, right? I don't want to speak about a marginalized group, not being in that marginalized group. And having myself um, at times years ago participating in that marginalization. Um, I assume what you mean is like speaking for them and defining their experience uh, yeah, or, or how or, they would articulate what they're going through. Exactly. Or really just talking about someone else's experience that I'm, um, I have no concept of myself. Um, but the more I sat with it, I, I realized I do have a lot to say about mm -hmm. a lot to say to the church specifically um, in how we have um, harmed um, people in the LGBTQ community um, mm -hmm. and the ways we have failed pastorally. So um, okay. that was the direction of the conversation I wanted to take this. Gotcha. Okay. So the focus on today's show is not so much, um, which is what I see a lot online is here's why they're something else. Instead, this today's show is very much about uh, how are we approaching this situation incorrectly? What does the church actually give us or what is the Holy Father modeled for us in how to deal with not just uh, our gay friends, but even anybody that we, we disagree with, which is, I mean, ultimately, it's like the whole tone of this show in every episode. It's like, it doesn't matter what somebody's uh, difficulty is, what my own difficulty is that somebody else has to be kind to me about. Um, it's understanding how to how to model, how to live out those uh, healthy relationships um, to actually witness the gospel. Okay, good. And then at the end, we will um, mention about the, this is the, the last episode of this season, season one. We'll take a little break, maybe for a couple of months and uh, rejuice and come back for, for season two, unless maybe something happens and it comes back even earlier. So, Welcome, friends, to Pope Francis Generation. It's the show for Catholics struggling with the church's teaching who feel like they might not belong in the church anymore, but who still hunger for a God of love and goodness. Your hosts are me, Paul Fahey, a professional catechist. And I'm Dominic, someone who needs catechesis. Together, we're taking our own look at the Catholic Church, her teachings and practices from three views that changed our world. And those are the Kerygma, the Doctrine of Theosis, and the teaching of Pope Francis. And at this point, if you're not sure what those are, please do check out episode one of this podcast. It does go through all of those. Uh, together with you, we are the Pope Francis generation. Alrighty, Paul, today's topic, pastoral care for gay men and women. Take it away. Yeah, I like, <clears throat> you know, I call myself uh, a catechist because that's what I am and that's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to start this conversation by going to uh, what the catechism has to say uh, about the topic of homosexuality. Um, the catechism only has three paragraphs devoted to this. Uh, so I want to read all of them and then I want to break down what is actually there. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to follow along, uh, you can either pull up your catechism online or, you know, if it's sitting next to you uh, conveniently, it starts at paragraph 2357. But I want to start here because a lot of the conversation uh, that I see in the church about this topic has some understanding of church teaching, um, but often overstates what the church actually teaches. So just as important as what the church teaches is what the church doesn't teach. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I want to point out. Any questions before I jump in? No, I think that's I think that's that's always an important place to start. Is what does the church actually teach, and then the rest is 
what we're reading into it or what other people have parsed for us and we've accepted without, you know, actually working through that. Yep. So, go ahead. Okay. So, like I said, this is paragraph, uh, starts with paragraph 2357. Catechism says, homosexuality refers to relations between men or between women who experience an exclusive or predominant sexual attraction towards persons of the same sex. It has taken a great variety of forms through the centuries and in different cultures. Its psychological genesis remains largely unexplained. Basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as acts of grave depravity, tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine, effective, and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. The number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. This inclination, which is objectively disordered, constitutes for most of them a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives, and if they are Christians, to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross, the difficulties they may encounter from their condition. Homosexual persons are called to chastity by the virtues of self-mastery that teach them inner freedom, at times by the support of disinterested friendship, by prayer and sacramental grace, they can and should gradually and resolutely approach Christian perfection. That is all that the catechism has to say about homosexuality. Um, even this, um, even just this teaching, I know in and of itself can be difficult uh, for people to hear mm -hmm. for LGBTQ Catholics um, in the church and outside of the church uh, because of um, the ways that this teaching has been misrepresented, but, but also really um, because, of, because of the teaching itself. So uh, you know, I hope and I pray in reading this and in explaining this that I do so with respect and sensitivity, um, as well as faithfulness to uh, the good news of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the church. So mm -hmm. um, that's the tone that I hope to, yeah. to have with this. Uh, any thoughts um, that you have after hearing this in its entirety? Yeah, um, well, maybe a couple. I mean, that's what we're going to do today is, is unpack these, because there's a little amount that is said but there's a lot of things that are assumed that are understood. And uh, a lot of people who uh, uh, are, are grappling with this or, um, or, or not, or who are outside of the church or no longer, you know, uh, being practicing Catholics and so on, a lot of us today don't think the same way the church does. We, and as far as we're concerned, we don't even live in the same universe of the way the church does. Um, so if you're, if you're a normal average person today in the first world West, you're, you're extremely materialist uh, in the sense that your, your physical body is is what you are. And that's that's basically it. And, and yeah, we talk about a soul and we'll kind of do a hat tip or head nod to that, you know, at Mass on Sundays, but we don't actually take that seriously. And uh, yes, God is there and something about angels maybe. And uh, I guess there's saints somehow, but you know, really all that matters is what we're going through here and now. And then the church comes along and says things that just seem completely disconnected from the the, the real experience. And it, if we are then trying to be faithful practicing Catholics, then the question is, what does the church see that I don't? Again, we're assuming the understand underlying understanding here is um, the church is, is uh, constantly doing her best to articulate and explain and understand this, this zip file of love and information that's, that's been, been gifted to us, um, you know, from God. So, all that being said, the one thing that does jump out at me is the the double standard I see a lot of us have, where we're okay to uh, ignore, um, you can call them sins, difficulties among divorcees or among other people in the church dealing with, you know, who, who are not dealing with this issue. But anybody who's like this is completely tarred and feathered. That is completely 
unjust. So if you're going to be consistent, be consistent. And the first step to that is being quiet because we usually, you know, we usually aren't. Um, at the risk of just continuing to, to ramble, I think that one there about a double standard for me is something that um, uh, I have a very hard time being quiet about. Um, I think that, uh, again, a lot of people in the materialist space, in you know, modern scientists and so on, they are trying to provide a lot of uh, discussion and research, and they're trying to provide answers um, around this. Um, time will tell, I guess, you know, whether it ends up being accurate or not. Um, but what scientists are bringing in, apart from pressure groups, is they are doing something that the church herself does not necessarily do, which is psychological uh, understanding, the, the, the progress of evolution in the human person, um, the development of human relationship, you know, through the evolution of the human body in time, and all of these things make things uh, confusing. So that's, we're kind of, with the church putting that aside, like it's we're not our competence to get into that. This show is more about the fact that this is a reality. And then what is our response? How should we be responding to this? So I guess my, the question I want to ask you is, how are people getting this wrong? You know? Yeah. So I think your observation about uh, the double standard is an excellent one. Uh, it is my observation as well, both in what I see in the church and what I have, like w what has been in my own heart at times, right? This double standard. For some reason, like um, other, some, and I think that there's, I mean, I think this is a really common experience that takes real self-examination. Like at one point, several years ago, I came to the realization that other people's sins that I don't struggle with somehow bother me more than the sins I do struggle with. <laughs> And yeah. that's not a problem with them. That's a problem with me. Um, that's a place where I need to invite the Lord to bring real healing and transformation because that's my problem. Um, yeah, I think you're correct to point out. And um, I mean, there is lots of lots of material in the church on giving an apologetic a defense of this teaching. That, that isn't my goal um, with this with this particular conversation. I, th I think there's a couple of things worth noting that underlie this teaching, though. Um, one is, uh, well, the church has taught throughout its tradition in, in Scripture that um, that homosexual sexual acts are um, uh, the phrase that the catechism uses intrinsically disordered, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're wrong. Um, that is different than a contemporary psychological understanding of the experience of homosexuality, right? Okay. So, um, and I'm not making predictions or advocating for church teaching. I'm, I'm just simply stating that um, just as the church since, you know, Vatican II has grown in our understanding of human dignity and our teaching, especially about war and the death penalty, um, has changed uh, as the church has grown in greater awareness of human dignity. Um, again, uh, well, the, um, the command or the moral law of homosexual acts being, uh, being intrinsically disordered, that is different than the experience of homosexuality, which the church is still growing very rapidly in our understanding of, mm -hmm. um, what that means or how that will play out in the church's teaching. I have no idea, but I believe the church is taking that into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, and this goes back to our discussion two or three weeks ago about the Pope's new document on uh, the liturgy. So one mm -hmm. of his points in that is, and, it, and this is a very Catholic worldview, and that is, I mean, you were talking about how the human person is both material and spiritual. And the Catholic worldview takes our materiality very seriously because mm -hmm. it's through matter that God communicates, that he reveals himself to us, that he encounters us, that he gives us his grace, his life, his healing, et cetera. It's through material stuff. Um, so we have to come to know that, and the Pope Francis says this in that document, in the liturgy, the signed value, the symbolic value 
of material things. And he mm -hmm. says, especially the symbolic value of the human body. Um, and there, I believe he's drawing from or teaching from not like there's no footnote to John Paul II, but I believe he's echoing back to teaching from John Paul II that um, there's something about the order of our material bodies that communicates something deeper than just a material reality. Um, right. So all the church's teaching on sex and marriage um, rests on that understanding as well. That something about our material body has mm -hmm. spiritual symbolic value. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you've even gotten to your question yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually, I think I might've forgotten what the question. Oh, <laughs> my, so the question that I was curious was, um, uh, because we, we can carry a lot of baggage of just tweets and comments and other things other people have said, or even something uh, our, our parish priest might have said that that's, you know, disconnected from, you know, the intention of the church. Um, and we just internalize these things, you know, and then uh, something comes up, we see it online, and we just trot out the things that we're used to thinking, because th those are just the habits that we formed around thinking them. So could we take like a minute to think through or just talk through uh, what are the usual responses that people are, are doing and having that are out of step with um, everything the church holds, you know, regarding the dignity of the human person? I mean, like one of them is, again, that double standard thing there is, is part of this. You know, it says that these acts are, are gravely disordered and so on. But, you know, you, the Ten Commandments, uh, half of those are all gravely disordered, too. That's kind of the point. No, it's not like you're a class of people and you're constantly in danger of gravely disordered attacks. Like, no, every single human being is, as soon as you open a browser tab, uh, as soon as you, you you look at a woman wrong, you enter into a business relationship with the wrong intentions, you know. It's like this stuff, in a way, it's all over the place, and it's not something that is exclusive to them. Um, uh, it, it's a universal human thing to be aware of these things. Now that the real issue is um, how to respond to them and you've got this the, the beautiful story that you've been sharing and i've already forgotten his name please excuse me he's on the icon behind your head saint um, mark saint mark not not Mickey. um in a, a similar situation like he had no control over his compulsion or his addiction to uh opium back in the 1800s i think it was um and he wrestled with that his whole life and he ended up being elevated as a saint you know to to people in his parish to write him off as a waste of a human being or something is that that is a terrible uh indictment on on themselves you know um not i'm not saying they did maybe they did but thinking of myself and my own past and immediately painting certain people with issues maybe i didn't struggle with like as if that makes me morally superior like you said that is an instant uh throwback to to the gospel parable where Christ is holding up the Pharisee and I think it's the Republic the Republican you know thank God I am not like them you know I I I have to be so much better versus the publican where it's like I I don't even have the capacity or even the appropriateness to be judging somebody else God be merciful uh, to me a sinner yeah yeah I was just reading a reflection earlier today that someone had sent me um, a snippet from something that Father Richard Rohr had written, and he was talking about, uh, I forget what the phrase was, the cult of purity or cult of moral perfection, or whatever, mm -hmm. in the church. And he, and we have this culture <clears throat> within the church and, uh, that he describes, and I think rightly so, where uh, we all pretend to have it all together, to be morally pure. And then we judge everyone else by how well they pretend at being morally pure. Um, but we mi to fundamentally misunderstand the church because the church mm -hmm. is the place for sinners, for people who are weak, for people mm -hmm. who need healing. That's the whole reason we have the church. Right. Not for people who, like the Pharisee, don't think they need uh, uh, any healing or any forgiveness mm -hmm. or any mercy. Um, and that's why... Right from the get-go, Pope Francis, one of his very first interviews after he was Pope, some, a journalist asked him, who is Jorge Bergoglio? And he said, his first response was, I am a sinner. Mm -hmm. um, because if only once we understand that we are sinners, can we actually move towards receiving God's mercy mm -hmm. and grace and healing. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, let's walk through. There's some key lines in this passage that I think will get at the questions that you're asking. Um, yeah. And I like your example to St. Mark, but I want to give a caution to that example as well. Mm -hmm. So th th there's a line from the catechism that I just read. It's when speaking of homosexuality, it says its psychological genesis remains largely unexplained. Mm -hmm. And I think this is important. Right. The church is not making any type of claim as to the psychological cause or reality or whatever of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, because that is not the church's purview. That's not her expertise. Her mm -hmm. expertise is faith and morals. And that's a question of science. Mm -hmm. What is the psychological origin um, uh, or conceptualization of the experience of homosexuality beyond the church's purview? So the church points to scientists when asking when it's a question that has to do with science, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I point that out because Catholic conversations about LGBTQ issues presume often a lot of psychological knowledge of these issues. Like, I can't tell you how many apologetic articles that I've read about homosexuality that compare it to uh, an eating disorder or compare it to um, some type of substance addiction. Mm -hmm. So that's my only caution with the example that you gave is that yeah. I see this a lot. I see mm -hmm. people comparing um, being gay to being an addict mm -hmm. as if they're somehow equivalent, they're like they're a comparable experience. Mm -hmm. And that is beyond the church's expertise to comment on that. That is not a Catholic position, even if it's coming from a Catholic source. Um. I also want to point out, so again, this passage from the Catechism says that homosexual acts, meaning homosexual sexual acts, are intrinsically disordered. Um, so what the church isn't saying here is that two men or two women being in a committed friendship or relationship, it's not saying that's intrinsically disordered. It's not saying two men or two women living together is intrinsically disordered. It's not saying two men or two women having non-sexual physical intimacy is disordered or wrong in any way. Um, none of these things are in any way prohibited by the church's teaching. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, I mean, I remember going to a conference several years ago on um, administering to, um, it was for Catholics, administering to um, LGBTQ Catholics in the church. And <laughs> it was, a, it was a very mixed bag. The positive thing was they had a lot of people who, uh, who were gay, um, sharing their experiences and sharing their thoughts. And that was, that was the best part. Uh, but there was a lot of pushback after the fact, because one of the speakers, even though this, this was a very con like theologically conservative, uh, conference and all of the speakers were very, very theologically conservative. One of the speakers was talking about, I think, what what is termed spiritual friendship, and that's this idea of uh, uh, two men or two women entering into some type of committed uh, committed relationship, even living together for mm -hmm. community, fraternity, companionship, um, and even like a physical relationship, non sexual physical intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as ways for um, gay Catholics to, um, to mm -hmm. live in, uh, in relationships in some way. And that was her experience and something she was talking about. And both her and the organizers of the conference got lambasted online after it from, I guess, super conservative, theologically conservative Catholics who are like, no, 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 that, you know, we can't be advocating for that at all. Mm -hmm. um, whereas again, if you look at what this passage from the catechism says, the thing that's intrinsically disordered are mm -hmm. homosexual sexual acts, not anything else. The church doesn't have a teaching on these other things. Yeah. 
Um, I want to see if I can find it. It's on the Where Peter Is website, but I'm I'm drawing a blank on the name. I think it was it was written by um, I think it was Nathan Tarowski, but I'm not sure. But it was it was on this topic of spiritual friendship, and uh, reading that blew a hole somewhere in my brain in helping me realize a huge flaw with um, modern Western uh, Christian culture, uh, if not culture in general. But it, it was, it, like you said, this, um, let me see if I can create, uh, create the context that I'm thinking of here. It's when you create a church, like what the Holy Father is doing now, that is a synodal church, where it's actively asking of everybody to participate in and voice their experiences within the community to create a, a, a hospital and a church that is for everyone. We will necessarily come into contact with what has been called the marginalized, those that culture conveniently can forget, or the those that, that culture tells itself are okay to, to ignore and not need to pay attention to because it's only practical to pay attention to the masses, to, to the, the normal in the middle when there is no attention paid to the margins. Um, it, it's what creates, of course, an incredible amount of pain, uh, of, of disconnection, of and all, all of that. And we've seen that through every culture in human history, whether that margin was uh, women or children, slaves, uh, people who don't think like you, people who are outside of your tribe, you know. Um, so then what this this article made this point that there is a there used to be this ceremony of friendship um where two people would have an incredible uh friendship love for each other that went beyond just like yeah let's go have beer at the pub and and we like you know playing balls you know ball games together um this is a, a level of friendship that um it's it's just more intimate and more intentional than any other kind of friendship. And we have lost that in the first world West. And we have basically, there's like a nominal friendship, just hanging out. And then there's 100% committed marriage. And, and there's no space for in the middle. And uh, realizing that there used to be, or as this article points out, and I'll put a link in the show notes when I can find it. There used to be this, uh, this ritual of, um, blessing this particular kind, like you said, this non-sexual, but deeply intentional friendship between people um, used to be a thing that we've known, we, it's still there in the archives, but we don't have a culture around this anymore. And that then leaves this gap in our culture for people who do want uh, to experience and live out that kind of friendship. And I can say that with just a glimpse of an understanding of it. Cause I remember being in, in high school at one point, I met this young man and I thought, I don't know how, but I love this guy. And we really had a, you know, like a great time, great friendship and so on. But I loved him in a way I didn't really quite get. It wasn't like other friends. And I didn't like him in, in a, like a marriage way or a sexual way. There was a degree of friendship that I had never been introduced to or explained. And, we ended up parting ways as I moved away from France into America and stuff. But that gave me an insight that this is a reality, I think, for a lot of people. And when there is no <clears throat> uh, space for understanding that this is something even the Greeks would define love in four, I think, four different ways. It's like love 101 when you go to Catholic college is how the Greeks talk about it. Our general culture doesn't. It's like frontier, you leave me alone or you get married to a woman. That's it, son. There's no more, there's no space for this more nuanced, you know, sort of thing. Um, that gave me an incredible amount of, of compassion for understanding that there is a huge flaw. Uh, and what ends up happening when we throw them out to dry is, or hang, I actually don't know the metaphor here, is the conflation of if a, a loving, committed relationship can only be conceived of as a marriage, and I don't quite know what to do with my sexuality, then all of this has to be folded together. And I strongly get the sense that there are a lot of deep uh, uh, gay relationships that aren't really that sexual, but are people who actively, intentionally love each other and are committed to each other and have created a space of community that nobody else can understand. But they get that there is something here that culture in general um, uh, hasn't incorporated. Yeah. 
I'm curious what how that's sitting with you where I'm I'm, I'm off or yeah. Um, I think you're getting at something really important. Um, in for whatever reason in Western culture, we have collapsed intimacy to um, sexual relationship or romantic relationship, and uh, especially physical intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, now, intimacy, which I'll define as like the ability to be vulnerable with another person, have another person see you as you are, right? Mm -hmm. And someone else being vulnerable with you. Intimacy is a deep human need. Expressions of physical intimacy is a deep human need. Not a want, not an extra, not an add-on. The problem is that we basically equate physical intimacy with sexual intimacy. Hmm. Now, sexual intimacy is an aspect, a really important aspect of physical intimacy, but it does not exhaust the spectrum of physical intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, and we see playing. So as a married person, I see this playing out in there's this, you know, unexamined presumption that your spouse should fulfill all of your need for intimacy. That mm -hmm. if you have an intimate friendship uh, with someone other than your spouse, that somehow that's that's wrong in some way. Like we have now burdened our spouses with fulfilling all of my social or all of our social needs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, oh, and we've made like sexual intimacy the thing that is supposed to fulfill all of our need for physical intimacy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think you get like the notebook, right? I mean, we, we all love the notebook for different reasons, maybe. But that is held up as like, I think it's this unfair uh, dream or expectation of romantic love that you complete me. You're all I need. Once I have you, I don't need any other human being. And yeah. actually, no, it's, it's a qualitative kind of relationship that is different. But you're not going to sign off connection with other human beings in intimate, you know, vulnerable ways. It's a yeah. different kind of relationship. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm sure there are marriages out there where the spouses are able to fulfill all of the, the social needs of each other. It, I mean, that's not my experience. It's not the experience of a lot of people that I know. Like, mm -hmm. I need to have friends out who aren't my wife <laughs> for mm -hmm. a lot of different reasons um, yeah. to fulfill uh, to, to fulfill social needs that I have. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you're getting on a key point that um, intimacy and even physical intimacy do not equate to sexual intimacy and mm -hmm. uh, it's not I, I think it's inaccurate to right. collapse those into each other and i think modern dating culture just shows this um and people get this and and it's now just become a, a well for some it's quite obviously a, a recreational activity they don't intend for it to be anything you know anything deeper anyhow all right keep yeah. going what's what's the next point you want to go yeah through? so and uh, this is a point that is under, misunderstood by a lot of people. So the catechism says, um, speaking of homosexuality, this mm -hmm. inclination is objectively disordered. So now it's not speaking just of homosexual sexual acts, but it's speaking of um, uh, the, um, and it kind of goes by different things, but the experience of sexual attraction towards persons of the same sex. That's what it's speaking about. That this is um, that this experience of attraction is intrinsically, or sorry, objectively disordered. So, um, what this does not mean is this is not a psychological claim. Mm -hmm. The church is not saying that homosexuality is a psychological pathology in some way; that it's a psychological disorder. The church is not saying that. Um, what the church uh, is saying is that this desire or this inclination towards sexual activity that is disordered 
that this desire or inclination is itself disordered because w the object of that desire is disordered. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, so to go back to your point about a double standard, this is not exclusive to homosexuality. Anyone who desires any type of sexual relationship with someone who they are not married to is having a disordered desire, right? Yep. And for those who want more, cue our episode on, what was it? Mortal sin, right? Number five or six or something. Mortal sin or chastity. We've talked. Yeah. 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 But, there we go. Chastity. But it's not even, it's not even, it's certainly not just uh, sexual sins either, right? The right. experience of wanting more material things than I actually need, I would say is an objectively disordered desire, right? I am not owed. It is not good. It is wrong for me to have material mm -hmm. goods more than what uh, I need. Um, or are appropriate for my state of what life. it takes for my state in life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And you can think about even, I mean, the church has a long list of things that are intrinsically disordered. You know, one of which is uh, um, inhuman, uh, treating your employees in an inhumane way. Right. So any uh, employer's desire to objectify, to cut corners, to underpay, to mistreat mm -hmm. their employees, that's a disordered desire, right? Mm -hmm. Or the church says and has repeated multiple times that deportation is intrinsically evil. So the, the desire to deport mm -hmm. people we don't want in our country mm -hmm. is a disordered desire. The church says that torture is intrinsically evil, you know, and this came up in the early 2000s in the wake uh, of 9-11, mm -hmm. um, where there was this, you know, this desire in our culture that was rising. That we need to do whatever it takes to get the information out of these terrorists, right, to prevent mm -hmm. this from happening again or to get back at them for what they did to us at 9-11. Mm -hmm. That's a disordered desire. So this is neither is this teaching on homosexuality a psychological claim nor is it a claim that's exclusive to homosexuality. Um, there have been um, uh, clerics in the church, including Cardinal Schoenborn, who was the, um, the guy behind uh, the catechism, actually. Um, really excellent thinker. Um, he has said... Um, or spoken casually about the church changing its wording on this particular teaching. Mm -hmm. Not because this, this teaching here is wrong, mm -hmm. but because, um, and this is my understanding, he didn't explain why he thought that. I would be in favor of changing this line in the catechism as well. Mm -hmm. Again, not because um, I believe it's necessarily wrong, but because right. it's so often misunderstood mm -hmm. and then, used to use in a harmful way because it's so often understood as well the church is saying homosexuality is a psychological disorder and then we treat homosexuality as if it were a psychological disorder mm -hmm. and that is not at all what the church is saying yeah um i'm not sure of many other uh spaces in the um i mean you don't really have compulsive murderers and uh uh, I mean, well, you've got compulsive gamblers, I suppose, but I don't know of many other places in the catechism where a particular uh, topic like this uh, is spoken in such a clear way, and not just a clear way, in a way that uh, has been weaponized so harshly uh, to, to just write, to label, and then to write off an entire group of people when, and I think you're, you pointed this out earlier, the, the church is, is also developing and, and deepening and uh, clarifying her understanding of the human person. And then that is coming up in contact with uh, how we're living this out or how things have been codified. Uh, and then realizing, yes, this is what the church teaches, but we don't need to keep uh, saying it in that way. Um, it's been said once, it doesn't need to be said again. This is, uh, anyhow, I'm... Yeah, which, which, which the church does all the time. Yeah. Like the church is always reframing and restating its teaching yeah. um, in some cases because uh, the church has learned new information yeah. um, about the world or about the human person. 
or in some cases because the way that it was taught before is not able to be received by the new the new generation or the new culture right. so we restate it in a way that it can be received right kind of like our whole last uh discussion on on hell and how it was uh it, i mean the church had been incredibly dogmatic about all of it that hasn't changed but she has reframed the priority of this teaching in light of uh the kerygma in light of the the fullness of what it means and it's still present we still must you know ascend and hold to it and all of that but it has to be held in a different priority and i'm probably saying it wrong here and I think that's the same thing that's kind of happening here is um, as we have opened these doors and we're welcoming in everybody and actively ministering to everybody, you know, along these lines, I love this attitude Pope Francis has, has been again modeling and is holding out for us this sense of um, trying to get sort of break down this holier than thou attitude, which it's so easy for all of us to fall into. Um, but the sense that he creates where we need the margins not just like you know good for you head to the margins let's take care of each other it's like no 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 you actively need this as a form of spiritual uh welfare you know it is in working with them meeting with them sitting with them that you will begin to see where you're not at a home base yet you know yeah. and it's so easy for us to sort of to self-congratulate ourselves when the parish all around us just is is great and 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 you know we're all on the same page but if there's no time being spent with those who aren't on the same page then you have had you're not building up any sense of capacity to deal with people who don't think like you who don't see the world the way you do or who don't experience it the way you do we need those who are not in our tribe to help us to see a lot of things one of them being what you think is your tribe probably shouldn't be because the church calls us to a human family, hence the Holy Father's you know, book on, on human fraternity, human brotherhood, on, on humanity itself. Yeah. Um, I would go, I would state that even stronger yet that okay. um, the church, church has a doctrine of a preferential option for the poor, which is understood as a, pref, a preferential option for the disadvantaged, or to use mm -hmm. Pope Francis's words, a preferential option for the marginalized. Mm -hmm. Why is this the case? Because Christ always identified himself with the marginalized mm -hmm. and not in an abstract way, in a very explicit way, right? When he talks about the last judgment and the criteria with which he's separating those who are saved and those who are not, the criteria is when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was in prison, you visited me, etc. Jesus is identifying himself explicitly with mm -hmm. the marginalized. Yeah. So by going to the margins, mm -hmm. yes, it'll help us. It'll expand our view of the world. It'll, it'll help us be better people. But actually, that's how we encounter Christ Jesus himself. Christ. Yes. And the church needs those on the margins to participate in the church. Otherwise, the church dries up, becomes mm -hmm. ineffective. Um, yeah. So we go to the margins because the margins are where we encounter Jesus. Right. Well, the margins are all of the pieces that we don't think should be included. And it's the moment that we think that, that we begin to realize, oh, I'm not fully Catholic yet. Because that's what the whole point of the word Catholic, catholicos is. Everyone. Everything. Everyone. Yeah. You know. Um, um, so. Yeah, I want to hit, uh, I want to hit a few more points here. Okay. So, um, uh, there's a line as well in the catechism that says they so um, uh, homosexual men and women must be accepted with respect compassion and sensitivity um i'm going to focus on the word accepted mm -hmm. um they're accepted as human beings of infinite value who are made in the image and likeness of god who have an immeasurably valuable gifts to offer the church and to the world mm -hmm. and the first thing is acceptance um, which isn't, we have a really hard time, I believe, in the church of, of equating acceptance and approval. Mm -hmm. Acceptance, mm -hmm. I would say, is a respect of someone's dignity and value and, and place in this life and in this community and in this church. Mm -hmm. 
Um, everybody's owed that, regardless of who they are, mm-hmm. and regardless of um, what we don't like about them, regardless mm-hmm. of their behavior. Everyone needs to be accepted. Mm-hmm. And then the catechism goes on, accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity, right? There is a preferential option in this acceptance. We must go mm-hmm. out of our way to accept with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Why? Because this is a group that has historically been marginalized and persecuted, including by the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the church goes on. The catechism goes on. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. Every sign of un so if it looks like unjust discrimination, it needs to be mm-hmm. avoided, right? right. Um, but this, the church needs, like I need, everyone, the church needs to sit with this because mm-hmm. we fail at this miserably. Every sign of unjust discrimination needs to be avoided. So just like you said, this double standard of treating um, the sins of gay people as worse than the sins of everybody else is unjust discrimination, mm-hmm. right? Treating yeah. this the sins of some other group as more grave, more wrong than my own sins or the sins of my tribe is yeah. unjust discrimination. And we do this, and sometimes we do this overtly, but sometimes, at least in, in my case, this is something that like was hidden deep within myself that I didn't even know that I had, but I had this, you know, I had this fear and I had this, and I had this disgust that went unexamined for years. Yeah. Um, until the Lord like provoked examination and provoked, Mm -hmm. um, real repentance from this, but we do this all the time and it's very subtle. But sometimes it's not subtle. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's examples in the church today in the U.S. where we treat someone uh, who's gay differently than we treat people who aren't gay. And mm-hmm. and examples of this. Um, and to me, this is so obviously clear. Um, when when like Catholic schools and Catholic parishes fire employees who are gay and in a relationship, Mm -hmm. um, but do not treat other employees who are also sinning just as gravely, Mm -hmm. um, don't treat them the same way. Why is this particular sin so much more offensive or so much more scandalous that Mm -hmm. we would treat these people that much differently? I think that's a profound scandal. And I think that that behavior by the institution Mm -hmm. speaks in a negative way is a anti-gospel to, Mm -hmm. um, to, to the message, to the message that the church is supposed to be sending. Um, sorry, now I'm getting fired up. Okay. Um, so any thoughts there? Um, I, I mean, obviously, and am in, in, in agreement with that. With that, I remember uh, growing up. There was a, a young man at our parish. It was a traditionalist parish. There was a young man there who seemed to be quite obviously gay, and um, I remember feeling unable to breathe the same air and be in the same room with him. Like everything about him irked me, and it was, it was just, I did not intend it, didn't want it. But that's the that way of treating someone like that had been modeled for me by everybody I knew. They all just, you know, that sense of, of instant disgust, of instantly writing off that person. And then leaving that community and um, starting to wrestle with my own, you know, commitment to being Catholic. And, and then beginning to, to start unpicking everything I thought I actually believed and realizing, oh, those are just habits and I don't actually I don't actually need those. I don't actually believe those. And in fact, the whole time I actually disagreed with that, but I was just, you know, butt dialing a response and it was just happening before I knew what it, you know, and intentionally called it up and there's, there it was. So actively walking away from that. And then the one thing that began to grow in me was the, again, I'll, I'll come back to the double standard because for me, that's kind of a big thing. The sense that somebody could be dealing with a severe porn addiction 
but nobody will know. And then they will post these harsh diatribes against people who are gay. And that makes me incredibly angry. Or the sense that there are some people who can't hide, you know, you can call it um, uh, whatever, that, that choice, that compulsion, it could be an addiction, it could just be a life choice, whatever. There are some people who feel like maybe I know that this is kind of wrong based on being Catholic, but it feels right and I should do it anyway. And I can't walk away from that. So I'm just going to do it. And there are some people who they can't hide that. And that's why it's called coming out of the closet. Then there's the rest of us who are keeping our addictions or our bad choices in the closet. Nobody will ever know because I cleared my browser history and I've got good, you know, whatever. And somehow that makes me morally superior and able to call out somebody and, and lead the crusade. It's like, I have more respect for somebody who is struggling to be authentic with what they believe to be perhaps good or true when it's in conflict with everything else that they know and they're trying to find a way to do both or they're abandoning one and they're trying to be authentic as opposed to those who are going to confession every week and receiving communion every week and still not making any real effort. And, you know, there are those of us who, who know who we are, not making any real effort to actually change because, yeah, I've got confession. I'm okay. Yeah. Or, or even um, to use a different example, you have a Catholic who owns a business who has employees and who doesn't pay them a just wage, right? which is a pretty high bar according to the church's teaching, right? A just wage should yes. be enough for someone to support themselves, their dependent family, to have enough for food, shelter, healthcare, savings, mm -hmm. right? Have enough for recreation mm -hmm. and not work so many hours that they're not actually at home, right? This is the bar of a just wage. And so you can have a Catholic business owner who doesn't pay his employees just wage, who doesn't even think twice about that. And that's fully public. That's not someone, even with someone like a porn addiction, like that's mm -hmm. not worn on someone's sleeve, right? Yeah. But do we as a church, do we as a parish community treat the business owner who's paying unjust wages with any type of uh, hostility or judgment or anything like that, but we'll treat, but we'll treat the guy who acts effeminate that way. Mm -hmm. Like and, that is, yeah, and and the point here is not to to start treating no no, no, no. consistent hostility. <laughs> like, no, not no, that we should be treating more people judgmentally. That is, right, right. but this is the definition of unjust discrimination, right? And that's where. Um, there are so many places in the world where they're not only executed, but they are, uh, you know, publicly shamed, or there's terrible things that happen, you know, to these kinds of people. And that's why we stand with people who, uh, even if we don't fully agree with their businesses and how they, they function, but if they are standing up for these human rights, uh, and that, especially in how they are unjustly persecuted around the world, we'll stand for any, if Muslims are being unjustly persecuted, we will fight for that that religious freedom will fight for the dignity of the human person. It doesn't matter the context. That is a fundamental um, uh, commitment to, to human thriving that, that we are all called to. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what the person's, you know, doing. It's uh, if we want that freedom for ourselves, uh, we have to be offering it to others. And that's not, like you said, it's not an endorsement of their life and their choices and so on but it is acceptance that they are who they are and they didn't ask us and they didn't ask our permission, but they are who they are. Uh, so that's the point of this whole discussion is we're not talking about everybody else. We are turning towards our own response yeah. uh, to all of this. Um, a few more points. Um, okay, as we start to wrap up here. Oh yeah, that has to happen. Um, <laughs> the catechism says homosexual persons are called to chastity. Which is true because everybody's called to chastity and chastity being as we, we talked about a few weeks ago the interior freedom to love others without even the desire to possess or control them everybody's called to that and then the catechism goes on um, um by the support of disinterested friendship prayer and sacramental grace they can and should gradually and resolutely approach christian perfection again like everybody else. Right. Vatican II said there's a universal call to holiness. Everybody's called to this. Mm -hmm. I think it's important here too to note 
of the catechism use the word gradual. And, we, and we've talked about this um, in other conversations, I, I think especially the one on NFP, where growth in holiness and growth in freedom, growth in our, when I say growth in freedom, I mean growth in our capacity to respond to the moral law, to live out the moral law, right, happens in time as a gradual process. Mm -hmm. This process can be marked by times when someone knows and desires what they believe what like, like the moral law, what is good, but they are not free enough to live that out. Mm -hmm. The church recognizes that, that reality with LGBTQ persons, as it mm -hmm. recognizes that reality with everybody, mm -hmm. that this process, that this is a process that happens gradually. Um, and that it's not like people, people wake up after being baptized and are now free from all the things that mm -hmm prevent them from living the way they want to. Um, yeah. So I guess overall, as a summary, the church needs to do so much better in living up to our own standards in so many ways. I mean, this is one way out of hundreds of ways the church needs to live up. I, mean, mm -hmm. I worked for the church for almost eight years. Talk about like paying on paying unjust wages, right? The church needs to live up to its own standards. Okay. But with, but with LGBTQ people, at least in the American culture, American Catholic culture, there's so much fear. There's so much fear from, uh, about people who are different, but I think a lot of this fear is maybe like that there's fear of a, that there's some nefarious political agenda that's going to harm my children or harm my family and impose on my personal religious mm -hmm. or economic uh, freedoms and liberties. And I feel like that has driven so much. And then this drives us. And what we do is instead of encountering people and listening to people and treating them as real people, accepting them as real people and hearing their experiences as real experiences, instead we take these ideas of the church's moral teaching, mix it with our own fear and discomfort, and then put people in a box. Mm -hmm. And then define people and categorize people and judge people based on these things versus as you've brought up a few times what's the model of pope francis he's the pope he obviously agrees with and affirms and teaches everything you know all all of what we just said all of the church's teaching all of the moral law okay but how does he treat lgbtq people he treats them with compassion and sensitivity and respect mm -hmm. even with uh, even with you know, uh, people who are transgender, he will refer to them by their preferred names and pronouns. And then he'll look at the camera and say, do you see what I did there? See how I referred to this person? I mean, this has happened where he's called out his own behavior to make a point. I'm encountering this person and their real experience. And I'm referring to them how they want to be referred to so that I can encounter them, so that I can listen to their experience. Not coming in with my ideas and imposing those on this person, but letting this person's experience shape me. And this pastoral approach uh, for, that we modeled by the Pope, I believe is absolutely necessary. Not a, not a pastoral model that seeks to cut off and exclude, but a pastoral model that always seeks to encounter and welcome and integrate back into the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, there you go. You, you, you pulled the Pope Francis card. I don't have a follow up to that. So, <laughs> um, so to end, yeah. um, we, we got to stop misrepresenting church teaching. We got to go back to what the church actually says and be mindful of what the church doesn't say and not speak on behalf of the church where the church herself has not spoken. Mm -hmm. And we cannot, and I can't emphasize this enough, we have to stop making love and acceptance dependent on someone's behavior. Love and acceptance are a given because someone is infinitely valuable and made in the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. It is not dependent on their behavior, period, full stop, end of story. But we don't do that. Instead, we make yeah. 
God's love and someone's belonging in the church, transactional. You must behave this way in order to be loved by God. You must behave this way in order to have a place in the church. We mm-hmm. make it transactional all the time, but it is not. Love and acceptance are not dependent on someone's behavior. Uh, I want to end with this passage from Pope Francis. So this is from his um, uh, his document, The Joy of the Gospel, one of his first documents, which is really um, his program for the church. He says this, the centrality of the kerygma. So remember, the kerygma is the proclamation of God's d- desperate desire to save every single human person. The centrality of the kerygma calls for stressing those elements which are most needed today. It has to express God's saving love, which precedes any moral and religious obligation on my part, because God's love comes before whatever my behavior is. The Pope continues. It should not impose the truth, but appeal to freedom. It should be marked by joy, encouragement, liveliness, and a harmonious balance, which will not reduce preaching to a few doctrines, which are at times more philosophical than evangelical. All this demands on the part of the evangelizer certain attitudes which foster openness to the message. So these are the attitudes that the Pope says we must have. Approachability, readiness for dialogue, patience, a warmth and a warmth and welcome that is non-judgmental. That's what the Pope is calling us to. That's mm-hmm. what Christ is calling us to. Um, and I believe that we all need as a part of the church do real examination of conscience as to where these places of fear and judgment and discrimination are in our hearts and in our communities and really ask for the grace um, and respond to the grace Mm -hmm. of conversion in these areas. I think it's, it's so important to understand uh, the phrase will be used. The church, will not make a demand on one person that she doesn't make on another. But I think that's not a good way to phrase that. I would rather something more like the church, you know, with, with God will invite everybody to the same level of um, effort and growth and, uh, and personal excellence and, and relationship with Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. There are no burdens that are laid on one person that are heavier than the other. Um, Everybody's called to the same, um, into that same relationship. And if we truly believe it for ourselves, then we must model this um, to, uh, to everybody else. Yeah. Well, very cool. Let's, uh, let's call it a wrap there for end of season one. Um, what are our thoughts for season two, Paul? Um, uh, oh, man. Well, I'm not going to make promises that I can't deliver uh, at the moment. Um, I think I want to spend a lot of time in season two, perhaps the whole season, talking about Catholic social teaching. Um, Mm -hmm. We'll see if that actually bears out or not. But uh, I'm leading a retreat at the end of August at a parish in West Virginia to a a retreat all about Catholic social teaching. So that's been on my mind a lot. And so that may be something I want to talk about, but, um, yeah, we're going to take a month or two off and, uh, and go from there. But, um, it, I'll have this in the, um, in the email, the newsletter that I send for this podcast, and maybe I'll include it in the show notes as well. Uh, a link to, uh, a short survey for our listeners, um, to let us know what you would like to see. Um, or what changes we can make to make this better for our second season. Um, your feedback's appreciated and really helpful. And yeah, we want to make sure that this podcast is um, meeting its mission and meeting the needs of our listeners. Absolutely. Well, please allow us to take a quick moment to thank the sponsor for um, for this show. And if you do end up uh, working with them, let them know Pope Francis Generation sent you. Uh, it's select to give, uh, as they say, more Catholic leaders choose. Select international tours over any other pilgrimage company. With 35 years of award-winning travel planning, they have a track record of excellence and faithfulness. 
And they're a small company with a big heart because every one of their pilgrimage trips helps to support and fund their 501c3 charity work, helping Christians to thrive in the Holy Land. So if you're ready to travel or if you're looking to lead a group of your own, take the next step on your pilgrimage by visiting selectinternationaltours.com. And yeah, say that Pope Francis Generation sent you. Um, the show is brought to you by Smart Catholics. Uh, if you've enjoyed this kind of discussion, it's exactly the kind of thing that we are working hard to bring together and create. Come on over, create a free profile, join us, uh, jump into sharing what you think um, on, uh, on each episode and also just in the community in general. Um, do hit the like button if you're watching on YouTube. It does help more people. Uh, the, you know, the YouTube algorithm to push this out to help more people see this, uh, if this was helpful. If you've got questions, Paul, where can people go if they would like, for example, you to respond directly to a question? Yeah, so so first I, I want to thank you, Dominic, and Smart Catholics for uh, all the support you've, you've, yeah, I mean, this show would not be possible without you and without Smart Catholics, so uh, thank you so much for that. Our pleasure. Um, yeah, you can find me at PopeFrancisGeneration.com. Um, where I share share podcasts and then my own writing. You can subscribe. Um, there's free subscriptions, and you can become a paid subscriber, get access to podcast episodes early and some other things. Um, but most importantly, you can, um, if you like this ministry, if you like what we're doing here on this podcast, uh, you can support that. It's only possible. I'm only able to do this um, because of your support. So you can check that out at PopeFrancisGeneration.com. Perfect. And friends, till next time. Say a short prayer for yourself and for us. And remember, don't be afraid to ask questions. Doubts can be a sign that we want to know God better and more deeply. Thanks again. God bless.